Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India topic for discussion now is secondary active transporters on the cell membrane. The context is this, we have been considering proteins on the cell membrane in six functional classes which can be remembered with this mnemonic. And in particular, we started discussing transporters on the cell membrane. They could be broadly classified into ion channels and carrier proteins. We have completed a discussion on ion channels and the transporters responsible for facilitated diffusion. We are now moving over to secondary active transporters. At this juncture, it is important to learn a new, a relatively newer terminology called solute carriers. This term solute carriers is reserved for both these classes of transporters and the genes which are responsible for synthesizing these transporters are named as SLC1, SLC2, etc., falling into 52 families. And there are 400 odd transporters in those 52 families which could fall under either of these classes of transporters. We should not use the term solute carriers to talk about primary active transporters or ion channels for that matter. The term is reserved only for these two classes of transporters. Now, this is the Wikipedia material on solute carriers and if you look at this array of solute carriers, they are so, there are so many of them and are we going to learn about all of them and remember about all of them? It is not going to be possible. However, just like we learnt about a few facilitated diffusion transporters which are better known and are relevant in day to day clinical practice, we are going to consider some secondary active transporters too, a selected few which will help us understand the system and which will help us understand renal physiology, cardiovascular physiology, digestive physiology and diseases thereof better. Now, the secondary active transporters just like all other carrier proteins exhibit saturation kinetics. The flux saturates at a certain concentration gradient, we have seen this earlier. While the facilitated diffusion transporters were generally uniports, the secondary active transporters transport at least two substances. Most often these are two substances, sometimes there may be more than two substances as well. Why do we call this process secondary active transport? Active transport would mean that at least one of these substances which are transported moves against its concentration gradient or moves uphill. Whereas, in facilitated diffusion, the substance that is to be transported moves along its concentration gradient. In secondary active transport, one of the two substances to be transported moves uphill against its concentration gradient and therefore, the process is active transport with reference to that particular substance. Now, it is called secondary active transport because the energy for uphill transport of one substance is not derived from directly cleaving ATP, which is what primary active transporters would do. They are ATP as enzymes, they would cleave ATP, energize themselves and move substances uphill. Secondary active transporters are not ATPase enzymes, 
and the energy required for moving one substance uphill is derived from letting another substance flow downhill along its concentration gradient. The analogy would be suppose you have a hill and there is a rock here. The rock sliding down the hill is an hexagonic process would release energy and if there is another rock here and you tie it to this rock which is tumbling down, this other rock can move uphill. So, downhill movement of one substance would pull another substance uphill. That is the mechanism of secondary active transporters. Active because one substance is transported uphill and secondary because this uphill transport is energized by or is secondary to downhill transport of another substance. Most often the substance that goes downhill is sodium. We know that sodium concentration outside is 10 times higher than inside the cell. Therefore, sodium can diffuse into the cell and downhill movement of sodium would energize uphill transport of another substance. The secondary active transporters that are important in the clinical context and the ones that we will be learning are sodium coupled transporters. If the other substance which moves uphill goes inward into the cell that is in the same direction as sodium, we call the process co-transport or symport. Whereas, if the second substance which moves uphill moves outward or in a direction opposite to sodium, we call the process counter transport. Can we call it antiport? It is better to use the term exchangers to refer to sodium counter transport. This slide is a summary of what I have just said. We will now consider sodium co-transporters, an overview first and then we will look at some information about each of these transporters. All these sodium co-transporters are found in the renal epithelia, all of them in the luminal border of the renal epithelia, the exception being the sodium bicarbonate symport which is found on the basolateral border of the renal epithelium. The sodium iodide symport is found in the thyroid gland. Let us look at specific locations of these transporters along the nephron first. These are found on the luminal border of the proximal convoluted tubule. This is the sodium glucose symport or SGLT. We will talk about that in the next slide. The sodium potassium 2 chloride symport, which takes 1 sodium, 1 potassium, and 2 chloride, chloride ions from the lumen into the renal epithelial cell, is located in the luminal border of the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. The sodium chloride symport or NCC is found on the luminal border of the distal tubule. The exception to all these is the sodium bicarbonate symport which is found on the basolateral border of the distal tubule. If the sodium co-transporter is located on the luminal border sodium will move into the cell and that is along its gradient and that energizes transport of a glucose molecule or an amino acid molecule 
from the lumen into the cell. Now, glucose or amino acid would be more concentrated in the cell because of continued absorption and then it will find its way out of the cell into the extracellular fluid and blood through a uniport on the basolateral border. We have seen that when we discussed facilitated diffusion. On the other hand, the sodium bicarbonate symport is located on the basolateral border and this being a symport will transport both sodium and bicarbonate out of the cell. We will discuss this a little later. Now, we will consider sodium glucose symport. In the session on facilitated diffusion, we saw that glucose moves out of the renal epithelial cell into blood via glutes, glucose transporters. And now we are going to see how glucose moves from the lumen, that is from the tubular fluid into the cell and then it would go out of the cell through the glutes. The transporter which is responsible for absorption of glucose from the lumen into the cell is the sodium glucose transporter, co-transporter or SGLT. Now, the sodium glucose transporter takes both sodium and glucose into the cell and it is active transport because glucose in the renal epithelial cell is going to be highly concentrated given that it continues to absorb glucose and it is that gradient from the cell to plasma which ensures diffusion of glucose across the basolateral border through the glucose transporters. Sodium within the cell is kept continuously low as in any other cell by the sodium potassium pump. The main job of which is to maintain internal sodium very low. The sodium potassium pump we will see later when we discuss primary active transporters in the renal epithelium is located only on the basolateral border and that maintains the gradient for sodium to move from lumen into the cell. SGLT is becoming an interesting protein now. It is not only responsible for glucose reabsorption in the renal epithelium, it is also responsible for glucose absorption in the gut. There are three substances which are fully reabsorbed from the proximal tubule itself and which are not allowed to appear in urine. These are glucose, amino acids and bicarbonate and reabsorption of all these three substances in the proximal tubule is by secondary active transporters. Now, the SGLT is also interesting because a new class of antidiabetics, the glyphlozins are blockers of SGLT and they prevent absorption or reabsorption of glucose from the gut or the renal tubule, thereby reducing blood glucose. It would be worthwhile considering if this herb, Gymnema sylvester, Sirukurunjan as it is called in Tamil, has any action on SGLT. There are reasons for me saying this, but it would be worthwhile looking at that. Sodium amino acid symport is responsible for reabsorbing amino acids. Amino acids cannot be lost just like that because they form proteins and it is not cost or energy effective for a cell to lose, for the body to lose amino acids and therefore amino acids are fully reabsorbed in the proximal tubule through this transporter. It is not just one. There are specific sodium amino acid transporters for different groups of amino acids. <coughs> sodium phosphate symport is responsible for reabsorbing phosphate. And then there are sodium solute symports. 
there are a lot of them which transport many substances. There are different kinds of sodium solute imports. Now we will move on to the sodium potassium 2 chloride import. We have already seen that the sodium potassium 2 chloride import is located in the luminal border of the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. The ion that is actively transported is potassium from lumen into the cell. We know intracellular concentrations of potassium is at least 30 times more than extracellular concentrations. And the energy for uphill transport of potassium is derived from downhill transport of sodium. This is clinically a very important transporter and physiologically this transporter is responsible for the countercurrent multiplier mechanism which concentrates urine. You have learnt about the mechanism at school and we will be learning about it in greater detail in renal physiology and it is active reabsorption of solute through this and subsequently through the sodium potassium pump on the basal lateral border which concentrates salt in what is called the medullary interstitium which then sets the stage for reabsorbing water. The medullary interstitium becomes hyperosmolar almost like a blotting paper which then would reabsorb water in the presence of antidiuretic hormone not in the thick ascending limb but subsequently in the collecting duct. So, this protein is the primary factor responsible for the hyperosmolar medullary interstitium which is important for concentrating urine. Therapeutically, a drug called fruzamide which is a blocker of this protein is used as a diuretic to increase urine output and this is used in varied circumstances like in the treatment of hypertension to get rid of excess fluid in the body what we call edema to reduce excess of extracellular fluid volume in congestive cardiac failure so on and so forth. So, fruzamide is a specific blocker of NKCC, the sodium potassium 2 chloride importer. Keep this in mind because of its specificity, fruzamide can cause deafness. So, when you study auditory physiology, keep in mind this fact and where does NKCC come into the picture in auditory physiology and why should frusamide cause deafness. Frusamide can also cause hypokalemia, a reduction in serum potassium. Serum potassium as such is very low, you know that it is between 3 to 5.5 and continued usage of this drug can reduce serum potassium to dangerously low levels. It can also cause an increase in plasma pH, what we call metabolic alkalosis. Now, why and how fruzamide leads to these states, we will see as we learn about renal physiology. The next sodium co-transporter that we have to know about is the sodium chloride importer or the NCC sodium chloride co-transporter found in the luminal border of the distal tubule. This is again the target of a class of diuretics called thiazide diuretics. The sodium bicarbonate co-transporter we have seen earlier is very different from all the other co-transporters that we have seen so far. While all those other co-transporters were located on the luminal border of the renal epithelium and therefore allowed sodium to move downhill into the cell, 
The sodium bicarbonate co-transporter located in the distal tubule is found only on the basolateral border. And sitting here, it can only cause outward movement of sodium because this is a symporter. We said that already. So, both bicarbonate and sodium would move outward. If sodium has to move from the cell to the outside, then that is the ion which is actively transported. So, we would rather call this bicarbonate coupled sodium transport. It is the energy of the bicarbonate gradient. A lot of bicarbonate is synthesized within the distal tubular cell and therefore, bicarbonate diffuses out and downhill transport of bicarbonate is going to cause extrusion of sodium from the cell. We will now consider the sodium iodide symport. It is found in the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is made of follicles lined by cells and the lumen of the follicle will contain colloid or the material where the thyroid hormones are synthesized by addition of iodine to tyrosine residues of a bigger protein there. Iodine required for iodination of the tyrosine molecules has to be absorbed from plasma and it moves from plasma into the follicular cell through a symporter located on the basal border of the follicular cell. We would call this the apical border, the one facing the colloid. The symporter, sodium iodide symporter is found on the basal border of the follicular cell. Sodium moves downhill and iodide is trapped. More and more iodide is trapped so that its concentration within the cell builds up. So, that is the actively transported ion and then iodide will move into the colloid through an iodide transporter on the apical border called pendrin. The sodium iodide symporter is a very important protein to learn about because that is the basis of using radio iodine for ablating deceased thyroid glands, for example, thyroid carcinomas. Radioiodine is transported through this transporter into the follicular cell and because of the radiation, it can destroy the cancerous cells. But the caveat is that not all thyroid carcinomas will express sodium iodide symporter because in a malignancy, there would be de-differentiation and the cell may not express sodium iodide symporter. Sodium iodide symporter is also important in that there are extra thyroidal sites where this transporter is found. It is found in salivary gland, prostate, it is found in breast tissue, lactating breast tissue. That is important because the source of iodine for the infant is breast milk and this transporter moves iodine into breast milk. Not just lactating breasts, it so happens that malignant breast tissue also expresses sodium iodide symporter. When I say expresses, the data is immunohistochemical, that is you find the transporter in the cell. That is what I mean by expression or there will be mRNA for synthesizing this protein in the cell and the protein will be found in the cell. Nearly 70 to 80 percent of malignant breast tissue expresses the sodium iodide symporter. But what is also known is that in all these malignant cells, though the sodium iodide symporter is found within the cell, it is not located correctly, it is not found on the plasma membrane and therefore cannot transport iodide into the cell. Now, I am saying this because there is increasing interest in using radioiodine to treat extrathyroidal cancers like breast cancer as well and therefore, it is important to understand that though 
a malignant breast tissue expresses sodium iodide symptom within the cytoplasm, it need not necessarily respond to radio iodine if the sodium iodide symporter is not found on the cell membrane. Only if it is found on the cell membrane, it would be functional and take up radio iodine which would help in destroying the cell. Going even further, there are attempts, experimental attempts still to induce expression of sodium iodide symporter in non-thyroidal, non-breast malignancies. There are attempts to induce expression of sodium iodide symporter by putting it into a viral vector and using certain strategies to let that vector home in onto malignant cells. The idea is if the sodium iodide symporter is expressed on these cells, then we can have very specific targeted radioactivity by administering radio iodine because the cells expressing the sodium iodide symporter would take up radio iodine. That's, that's the hope. This is still at an experimental stage. Work is being done on cell culture systems and animals. And I am not very sure if there are any clinical trials where there is induced expression of sodium iodide symporter in extrathyroidal cancers using viral vectors followed by radio iodine administration. A lot is known about the biology of the sodium iodide symporter because that symporter can be used to one's advantage. We will now move on to sodium counter transport or exchanges. There are two important exchanges that we should know about, the sodium hydrogen exchanger and the sodium calcium exchanger. The sodium hydrogen exchanger is again located on the luminal border of the proximal tubular cell along with the other sodium co-transporters. I made a statement a little while earlier that there are three substances which are reabsorbed fully in the proximal tubule bicarbonate, glucose and amino acids. And the protein responsible for bicarbonate reabsorption is sodium hydrogen exchanger. Now you would wonder why is it not a sodium bicarbonate transporter, why is it a sodium hydrogen exchanger and how does that help in bicarbonate reabsorption. The details we will consider in renal physiology, but just remember that these three proteins are responsible for almost complete reabsorption of bicarbonate, glucose and amino acids in the proximal tubule. In fact, there is a familial syndrome for fa called Fanconi syndrome where these tr sodium couple transport processes in the proximal tubule are affected and the individuals have metabolic acidosis because they lose bicarbonate in the urine. They also have glycosuria and amino aciduria. You normally do not find glucose, amino acids or bicarbonates in urine and in this condition you will find all of them coming out into the urine. The next exchanger that we should know about is the sodium calcium exchanger and it is best learned in the context of cardiovascular physiology. Sodium calcium exchanger, the best known function of the sodium calcium exchanger is in the pacemaker cell. This is the heart and this is the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node expresses the sodium calcium exchanger. This exchanger on the pacemaker cell exchanges sodium for calcium, three sodium ions for one calcium ion. That is three cations going in for just two positive charges coming out. This amounts to an invert current being generated with this protein and now you should understand that even transporters, not just ion channels are involved in shaping membrane potentials. Here is an invert current that can depolarize the cell 
And we know today that the sodium calcium exchanger is the primary pacemaker mechanism in the heart, not an ion channel, but this transporter is the primary pacemaker mechanism in the sinoatrial node. This mode of transport, sodium invert calcium extrusion is called forward mode NCX and would end up depolarizing the cell. This transporter can work bidirectionally and in some situations can actually extrude sodium in exchange for calcium coming in. Remember, both sodium and calcium are very low within the cell. Both have a gradient to go within the cell. This exchanger can either use the sodium gradient to push calcium out against a gradient or use the calcium gradient to push sodium out against a gradient. This mode is called reverse mode operation of the sodium calcium exchanger and because it extrudes sodium, extrusion of sodium is very important for volume regulation in a cell and because it extrudes sodium, it can, it can support or, or, or complement the function of the sodium potassium pump when the pump is not able to do all of extrusion of sodium all by itself. Because this transporter takes in calcium in reverse mode operation, reverse mode operation of the sodium calcium exchanger is a strategy to increase contractility of the heart. If you want to improve force of contraction of the heart to improve cardiac output, one strategy would be to put the sodium calcium exchanger in reverse mode operation. How exactly that is done, we will see when we do cardiovascular physiology. This is a slide where the sodium calcium exchanger is shown in the context of other calcium transporters in the myocardial cell. All these will be discussed by Dr. Anand Baskar. With that, we complete our discussion on secondary active transporters. Thank you for choosing to watch this NPTEL lecture.